Okay, so uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity to talk here and to do my first trip to India. Um, so yes, so today I would like to, to tell you about uh, some work that we do in the Quantronics group at CEA Saclay. So this work is a collaboration with uh, the group of John Morton at UCL in London and the group of Klaus Mölmer in uh, Aarhus University. And uh, yes, the title is uh, Magnetic Resonance at the Quantum Limit and Beyond. And uh, as uh, Chris Westbrook made me notice one day, this has a very much a Buzz Lightyear flavor that uh, uh, is. And so uh, just uh, maybe a, a first few words about uh, what, where is our group? And uh, so uh, this is the, the Plateau de Saclay is, is here. This is uh, Paris. Uh, so you see this is uh, 20 kilometers uh, southwest. This is, uh, we are very, very close to uh, the lab that uh, Jacqueline Bloch uh, has, has showed you. This is a, a map of the campus, and there are many uh, scientific labs and, uh, and schools and universities around. University d'Orsay is, is very close. And uh, we are a group uh, that does research in quantum mesoscopic physics, quantum technologies, and quantum information processing. So my message is, if you come to France, please visit us. We have uh, open positions, and uh, also please visit us. <laughs> So, so today I would like to, uh, to talk about uh, uh, what we do and the motivation for this research uh, is really uh, the fact that uh, we would like to uh, uh, start from uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is, uh, as, as you may know, a very important technique in all fields of science, um, but uh, it is characterized by a rather low sensitivity uh, you need a large ensemble of spins to detect a measurable signal uh, in such a spectrometer. And so, uh, essentially, this means that we can measure macroscopic samples. And uh, from a more fundamental point of view, uh, even though uh, microwaves are used to drive these spins and also to detect them, the interaction between the spins and the microwave is, in general, uh, completely classical. So the microwave field uh, the quantum fluctuations of the macro microwave field play absolutely no role. And uh, so, th so the, our idea is that um, uh, maybe uh, using uh, concepts and techniques uh, borrowed from uh, the field of superconducting quantum circuits, so this is uh, circuit quantum electrodynamics, as uh, uh, exactly, uh, we use exactly the same tools uh, as I will tell, tell you, uh, as Michel showed you, uh, but also Cater, DJ, many others are developing. Uh, we would like to uh, develop some different form of magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which would be more quantum, um, and where the key words would be a much higher sensitivity. We, would op we, will op we operate at millikelvin temperatures, and uh, we see uh, uh, signatures of the quantum fluctuations of the field. So, so now the spin to microwave interaction needs to be treated quantum mechanically. And one of our goal, uh, short-term goal, I, I hope, is in fact to push these uh, methods of detection to the single spin uh, sensitivity, even though, as you will see, we are not there yet. So uh, maybe first a few words before uh, going to what we actually do about the fact that uh, I, I, I mentioned that the spin detection has a low sensitivity. Uh, this is not always true. There, there have been alternative methods that have been developed in the, uh, in the recent years uh, to detect spins without a cavity and without microwave signals. So, uh, for instance, in certain cases, uh, spin signals uh, actually translate into a change of the resistance, the conductance of the sample, and that can be detected, and that leads to some sensitivities that are in the 100 spins range. Uh, in certain cases, uh, spins also have an optical transition, and this optical transition can lead to spin-dependent photoluminescence. This is the case for the celebrated NV centers in diamond. This is uh, actually data taken in our lab, uh, where you see a single NV center, and this is a Rabi oscillation uh, taken on this individual spin. So evidently, uh, there is single spin sensitivity. Uh, Scanning probes have been also used to detect uh, uh, 
individual spins. Uh, mechanical resonators can be used. Scanning NV centers can also be used. And finally, in some systems, it's possible to do spin to charge conversion, which then uh, also leads to single spin sensitivity. And we'll hear, hear much more about that tomorrow with Guido uh, Burka. But uh, as you may notice, all these, all these alternative techniques are uh, somehow system specific, are often system specific. And uh, this is why uh, it is nevertheless interesting to look uh, to a different way. This, this problem of spin detection is, is not, uh, is, I would say, not over. Uh, there is not a, like a definitive a good method to detect any spin. And this is why we, we believe that we would like to push the standard inductive detection method uh, to the single spin unit method. So uh, what do I mean by this standard method? So it's time to uh, uh, go back to uh, uh, early classes uh, of, of physics. So we are considering uh, a, a sample that contains spins. So uh, these spins uh, are placed in a magnetic field B0, a static field uh, that polarizes them. So uh, and, and this sample is placed in a, in a cavity. Thank you. So, uh, yes, so, so, so uh, and, and then this sample is placed in a microwave cavity that has a resonant mode, and uh, the, the, the magnetic field is adjusted so that the Zeeman uh, splitting on the spins is resonant with the cavity. Then the, the spins can be driven by sending uh, microwave pulses um, uh, to this system, and uh, for instance, it's possible to do a pi over two pulse where the, the Bloch vector will, will rotate in, in this way. Um, and then after such a pi over two pulse, uh, one can wait. And during this waiting time, the spins, uh, 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 magnet, uh, the, uh, spins have uh, various uh, Larmor frequencies because we are now dealing with an ensemble of spins. And uh, because of this spread in uh, Larmor frequency, the um, magnetization, the, the uh, total magnetization of the sample will actually go back to zero simply because each spin will rotate at its own frequency. But it's possible to counteract uh, this spread of, uh, uh, of, of Bloch vectors uh, by applying a pi pulse after a time tau, and this leads to some kind of uh, uh, Re time reversal, uh, which, which leads to uh, the refocusing of all the, the spin uh, magnetization uh, at a time tau later. And so this uh, buildup of this uh, magnetization will now lead to the emission of an echo. So this is the, the standard magnetic resonance detection. Uh, you have two control pulses, pi over 2 and pi, that lead to the emission of an echo. And this echo contains all the information that you want. Uh, then you, you, you look at the amplitude magnetic resonance more or less consists in uh, studying the amplitude of this echo as a function of many parameters, uh, as a function of B0, as a function of time, uh, etc. And so really the, the question of the sensitivity is uh, uh, how well can I detect this echo? Uh, and so in a sense, what is the minimal number of spins that are needed so that uh, this echo can be detected with a signal-to-noise ratio of one. And uh, so a, a very simple analysis uh, has to, uh, to take into account the way that this microwave echo is uh, actually detected. So this echo is uh, routed with a circulator to some uh, amplifying chain, and uh, this will contain a first amplifier, and then be demodulated by some uh, mixing with a local oscillator. And in the end, we will end up with two quadratures of the field, uh, which I write I and Q. Okay. And so one of these quadratures will contain the echo. The echo is, uh, has a well-defined phase. And we can tune the phase of this local oscillator so that, for instance, the echo is on I. So really, the, 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 this n min uh, number of spins is just the ratio of the noise in this uh, final uh, detection, uh, divided by the amount of signal that comes from one spin. Uh, you mean this pulse? Ah, so, so this is emitted by the spins. So there is no, yes, this is the, uh, 
this is the echo. It's a, you really have to think of an echo. It's really uh, the case. The spins now uh, come back into phase. Uh, you see, during all this time, uh, all the, the spins uh, magnetization are out of phase, but they will come back in phase uh, at this time, precisely at this time, uh, which will lead to the buildup of uh, macroscopic magnetization, transverse magnetization. So it's a, an oscillating uh, dipole, if you want, that will lead to the emission of a microwave pulse. Okay? Yeah, so if, if this is not clear, please interrupt me because this is very, this is key to, to this talk, of course. Okay, so, so uh, now what is the signal from one spin? Well, this can be uh, rewritten in dimensionless units as the single spin cooperativity. Here again, this concept of cooperativity, uh, which, uh, which is a, a simple quantity uh, where the frequency of the cavity and its quality factor uh, play a role, uh, as well as the coherence time of the spin and uh, this parameter g squared. And here g again is uh, a key quantity. Uh, g is the spin photon coupling constant. So this is the parameter that uh, it describes the strength of the interaction between one spin and one microwave photon in the resonator. This is the James Cummings G. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, so, this, so this is the, the, the signal. And what about the noise? So the noise we can also write in dimensionless units. This is, uh, is Ni, is the, just the ratio of the noise power spectral density. I can, uh, you see this is noise. The spectral density here can be rescaled by h bar omega. And now this dimensionless number is in fact the sum of two different contributions that have nothing to do with each other. First of all, uh, there is the equilibrium noise uh, at the, the sample that comes essentially by, from the johnson nyquist uh, thermal noise in the, uh, in the measurement line, basically. This is just the, the thermal noise at the sample. And then there is also the, con the noise which is added by the amplifier uh, in, the, in the detection chain. So this is really the, the sum of these two quantities that, uh, that, that provide the total noise uh, at the output. And finally, the amount of signal is also rescaled by one quantity, which is the spin polarization at finite temperature. Uh, not all the spins uh, may be in the ground state, so uh, the signal is just proportional to the difference between uh, the number of spins down and the number of spins up. Uh, and so, yeah. So, that's, uh, so, so now, if we uh, if we uh, rescale, so so we can write this uh, uh, this formula as a, in a in a graph with uh, on the x-axis. This is in a sense the, the signal, uh, and this is the noise, and then we have uh, ISO sensitivity lines, and uh, really the usual spectrometer uh, commercial at 300k is is here. And you see that the, this minimum number of spin is 10 to the 13. So this is a very, this is what I meant by low sensitivity. Uh, yes. But it's of course possible to do better. And uh, by uh, going to lower temperatures and improving also the, the spin photon coupling uh, and uh, the, the quality factor of the resonators, uh, up to a few years ago, uh, we, we were at this limit. This was a bit, uh, the 10 to the 7 was a, a bit the, the state of the art. And uh, in this talk, we are motivated to go further in this direction, more signal and uh, less noise by going to even further uh, lower temperature. And so uh, going to lower temperature uh, means that uh, this equilibrium noise, this johnson nyquist noise, will be reduced. But uh, of course, so this is at, at when the temperature is high compared to the frequency, uh, this uh, reducing the temperature will, will allow to decrease the noise uh, linearly in, uh, in variance. Uh, this is well known, but uh, when we reach the, the, re the limit where the temperature is smaller than h bar omega naught over k, this noise uh, stops decreasing. And uh, we are now uh, in, because the field now in its quantum ground state, uh, which is the vacuum, but even in the vacuum, uh, field, there are field fluctuations uh, which are now uh, fixed by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this is what we call this, this quantum limit. And in our experiment, we use the same type of parameters that circuit QED experiments use, uh, 7 gigahertz, 20 millik, 
we are deep in this regime. So, but as I mentioned, uh, going to these very low temperatures is not sufficient to actually have a minimum noise at the, at the output. One also needs to care about the noise added by the amplifier. So this is why uh, in our experiments, uh, we have introduced, we are also using uh, the new tools that have been developed by CircuitQED uh, to have the lowest noise possible. And we are using uh, the amplifiers that Michel has uh, described uh, in his lectures. These are the Josephson parametric amplifiers. So uh, we use a slightly different design uh, than uh, Michel showed, and I will uh, describe it in a few words, but essentially, uh, the principle is very, very similar to what Michel uh, told you, and here is a list of references that describe this type of devices, and there are many other papers. <laughs> so, uh, our device is uh, essentially a LC uh, circuit, superconducting LC circuit, uh, which uh, is measured in reflection. So, it has uh, one port, the signal is routed uh, onto the res this, this uh, resonator by a circulator, then it, uh, it enters the resonator and leaves it. So uh, this LC uh, oscillator also contains a chain of squids, an array of squids, and this, this is the active device uh, here. So uh, now, uh, if, if there is... Uh, so so uh, the, the squids behave as a tunable Josephson inductance. And so the, this, this Josephson inductance is tuned by the magnetic flux that threads these, these loops. And so uh, by changing this, by passing current uh, into a nearby antenna, one can uh, change this, uh, this magnetic field, and uh, this leads to a tuning of the resonator frequency. And this is the tuning curve, uh, which is shown here. You see that you can tune uh, by quite a, a large amount, a few gigahertz, uh, as a function of the, of the flux. But now this is uh, by, I was speaking of DC current, uh, but uh, w then we, we can tune the DC current at a given point uh, for the, the frequency at which we want to operate the amplifier. But then to actually perform amplification, uh, we need to pump the system uh, and we need to provide, this is the way that we will provide energy that will lead to amplification. And this pumping is done by uh, the same line, which is here. Uh, and this antenna, via this antenna, will also send some uh, AC pump tone uh, which is at more or less twice the resonator frequency. And this will lead to parametric amplification, and this time the signal uh, will actually leave the device with a higher, a larger amplitude than it, than it entered by down conversion of these pump photons uh, into the signal mode. So this is, a, in a sense, this is the... So it's a, uh, it's, it's a degenerate... So compared to the JPC, it's a system in which the signal and the idler are, in fact, uh, the same, the same mode. It has uh, one less mode than in the JPC. And so you, you can see that this system uh, amplifies. So this is uh, the gain uh, as a function of the detuning between uh, the signal frequency and half the pump frequency. Uh, this is the, the, the half the pump frequency is the frequency at which the gain is maximum. And this, this amplifier has a modest bandwidth of 2 megahertz. Uh, note that uh, we use, so in this, uh, in this talk, so we, we, we like a lot this design uh, because it allows to operate uh, the amplifier in the degenerate mode, as exactly as Michel explained. So in this degenerate mode, the, the pump is exactly at twice the signal frequency. And this is a slightly more complicated mode of operation because then the gain will be phase dependent. Uh, as, as Michel explained, uh, it will actually squeeze the signal. One quadrature will be amplified, the other will be deamplified. And this is what we see here. This is the gain as a function of the relative phase between the signal and the pump. And you see that you can reach 23 dB gain, but you can also reach minus 23 dB gain on the other quadrature. So th this is so this is actually a bit worrying, but it is also very good in, a, in another sense. It means that uh, we we only measure one quadrature, which means that we can amplify this quadrature without adding any noise. So this this uh, amplification of this quadrature is absolutely noiseless. 
So this is this, the CAVES theorem allows that because only one field quadrature is amplified. So, which means that really at the output of this device, uh, the, the noise in the, in the signal will be entirely dominated by the equilibrium noise that will be amplified. Of course, this noise has not vanished. There is still noise, but that is the only uh, origin of the noise. That is the, at least the main contribution. So it's the, the output noise is really dominated by the quantum fluctuations of the field at the resonator uh, location. So, uh, as Michel said, this, this, uh, using this uh, uh, parametric amplifier in a degenerate mode is not suited for all applications. Now, it turns out that for magnetic resonance spectroscopy, it is actually well suited. Uh, why is it so? It's because we know the phase of the signal that we want to amplify. The signal that we want to amplify is an echo that comes from a spin ensemble. This echo is triggered by control pulses, but the phase of these control pulses is also uh, controlled by us. So we can very well arrange things so that the, the phase of these pulses is chosen so that the echo emitted is, has the right phase to be amplified by the JPA in degenerate mode. This is a, a schematic. Uh, so, so I've spoken a lot about the setup, but uh, now what kind of uh, actually res resonator uh, do we use? And what is the, 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 the ESR spectrometer really? So, so we use uh, here again uh, superconducting circuits uh, to build uh, high Q and small mode volume resonators. So this is a, a lumped element LC uh, resonator. Uh, this is uh, the substrate, it should be as inert as possible. Uh, and then on top of it, we just have this, uh, this uh, comb, which is a, a capacitor, and which is shunted by a wire, uh, an inductor. So it's really the simplest circuit one can think of. And the active region of this device is this inductance for us, because this is where the magnetic field will be maximum and will couple to the spins in the neighborhood. So. In, the, in most of the results that I will show, we use a wire of five microns uh, a width, and uh, this, this wire, so the current would uh, flow, the AC current would flow in this direction, which will generate a B1 field, which will have this kind of, of uh, geometric dependence. And now we apply the B0 field parallel to the sample surface, because uh, we, we don't want to induce losses in the resonator, if we would apply it perpendicular to it, it would cause a problem. And it, so we, we can apply more or less uh, any field we want, but in the, as long as it's in the plane. So uh, what about G? Uh, so with these parameters, uh, we find a, a coupling, spin photon coupling of 50 hertz. So it's not so large. This is really a bit like uh, in uh, uh, optomechanics in Ash lectures. Uh, so, essentially, we are in the weak coupling, bad cavity regime of uh, circuit Q. But nevertheless, uh, we, we can do interesting things. So, so this, this sample is included in, in this uh, copper sample holder. This is just a, a box, essentially, that is convenient to probe uh, this resonator uh, in uh, reflection or in transmission. And so this is a, a transmission a spectrum of the resonator. You see that we, are, we can have relatively large Q of 300,000 at 7 gigahertz. So, uh, so far I only, so I, I didn't speak of the spins. So in our system, the spins are in fact in the substrate, which is also uh, carrying the, the, the resonator. And these spins are donors in silicon. And so we use bismuth donors. So uh, imagine the silicon lattice where you replace one silicon atom by one bismuth atom. Uh, so now this bismuth atom has one extra electron, and uh, at room temperature, this extra electron is, is ionized. It is in the conduction band of the silicon. But now, if you cool down the, the, the system, uh, there are hydrogenoid states uh, around this uh, bismuth plus uh, ion, and so the electron can be retrapped in, uh, in the vicinity of this atom. It is still an electron of the silicon. I, I really insist it's not... It has no bismuth character at all. It's, uh, it's just a, an electron uh, in, the, in the silicon. So you have to think of it as a silicon quantum dot 
which is where the confinement potential is provided by just one uh, positive charge. So uh, the only remaining part of the, uh, of the silicon really uh, lies in the hyperfine interaction between this electron spin and the nuclear spin of the bismuth atom. So the spin Hamiltonian uh, contains a uh, Zeeman term of the electron uh, spin, but also of the nuclear spin, this is the I uh, operator, uh, plus the hyperfine coupling of the two. And now bismuth is a, uh, has a big spin, nine half, uh, and so there are lots of states, it's not at all a spin half. Uh, and, and so uh, essentially we have, uh, 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 at, at B equals zero, we have a, a two um, manifolds of, of states, one ground manifold with nine degenerate states, and the excited state is, is 11 degenerate excited states, separated by 7.37 gigahertz. And when we apply a small magnetic field, essentially these degeneracies will be lifted, and so the, the 20 states will, will appear. And, uh, but these 20 states, uh, not all transitions are allowed, there are selection rules. And to, to, to make the story short, this is the, uh, the spectrum of the 10 allowed uh, ESR frequencies uh, at moderate magnetic field uh, uh, of up to 10 millitesla. And, and you see that uh, we, so we can easily uh, bring these spins in resonance with our resonator with a small uh, applied field. And, and so, yes, and, and the spins, I must say, are implanted in the silicon. They are not everywhere. They are really at the surface in the first 100, 150 nanometers. So this is a picture of uh, the dilution fridge. So this is uh, uh, the, the four Kelvin plate where we put our uh, hemp amplifiers. But uh, the interesting part is really the 10 millik, uh, say, volume, which is actually quite large. So this is the interesting things in these uh, fridges. And uh, this is the, 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 the setup where you have coils and, and also the sample. And here you have various circulators and filters. This is quite typical of, for these experiments. This is a, a closer view in an, actually in another fridge. Uh, and and, and yeah, this is the coil. And the parametric amplifier is sitting in another box uh, next to this coil. Uh, so so it's, they are connected by simple cables. OK, so uh, now we have this system, and uh, we do this spin echo. And, and so this, these are the typical signals that we detect. Uh, this is a, the two, these are the two control pulses. And then we have a, we, an echo. So this we apply the pulses, but there, here we, we just receive the microwave signal from this. Right? And so this is the, now all our data are obtained by uh, integrating this echo and, um, yes, and, and plotting this, this uh, echo amplitude as a function of various parameters. For instance, the magnetic field. So this is now the spectroscopy of the spins. This is the, 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 the resonance line. And you see that it actually has some kind of weird shape. So I don't want to spend too much time uh, on, this, on this topic. But let me just say that uh, this, this uh, weird line shape, so this is really due to, uh, this, these are a large ensemble of spin. Huh? And normally, we should see just one line. We see these two lines uh, because uh, there is mechanical strain uh, uh, operate, acting on the spins and which is due to the differential thermal contraction between the aluminum wire and the silicon itself. And this leads to regions uh, where we have compressive strain and tensile strength strain. And, and this, this shows up in these two lines. And so in fact, we have been able to attribute each line. So, so the, the, this low field line is in fact coming from the spins that are just below the wire. And the high field line is actually due to the spins that are outside. If you are interested, you can ask me more details. And so uh, we will tend to work in, at this field where we, the spins are, are just below the wire. So we can do Ravi oscillations uh, by uh, varying the amplitude of the refocusing pulse. And so these are uh, typical data that we obtain. And this is interesting because it allows to calibrate the coupling constant. Uh, indeed, the Ravi frequency is very simply uh, given by the product of this uh, coupling constant by the square root of the photon number in the cavity. This, this photon number we can estimate by knowing the input power and the various coupling rates of the, of the resonator. And we find a good agreement with this 50 hertz that we, we thought we would have. 
So we can also measure the coherence times of these spins. This is uh, using this uh, Haneko, but now varying the time between the control pulses. Uh, and so as, as a function of time, we see the amplitude of the echo uh, decay with time. Uh, and the T2 here is uh, 10 milliseconds. This is typical. So this is a long number, but uh, this is actually typical for spins. This is why spins, these spins are so interesting. They can have long coherence times, in fact, much longer than this. This is, so this is a, a, a nice number. This is actually, uh, I have to specify that we are working with isotopically purified uh, silicon, where uh, nuclear spins have been removed by working with enriched in sample, where, uh, which is enriched in silicon 28. Um, yes. And so now, uh, coming back to this question of sensitivity, uh, we, we, we would like to, to determine it, and because this is really uh, our motivation. So uh, to do that, we uh, take a, a single uh, spin echo sequence, uh, and we, alors, so the uh, first thing that I want to mention is the interest of using the JPA. Maybe we, can, uh, we can first look at this. So this is the echo uh, with the JPA on, this is the blue trace, and the same echo where we just turn off uh, the JPA, and we just measure with the Hemp amplifier. Of course, the signal would be much smaller, but we can rescale it uh, to get the same amplitude. Of course, the noise is also amplified, as you see. So this is a really clear and vivid uh, demonstration of the interest of using these amplifiers. Uh, most of you are aware of that, but at least it's, it's always good to, to see. The, the, the gain in sensitivity is really a factor 10 or a factor 100 in measurement. OK, so now uh, to, to estimate the sensitivity, we, we, uh, we, we determine experimentally the signal to noise of this uh, echo, and we divide it by the number of spins that are participating in this experiment. And with simulations, uh, we can determine it uh, to be 12,000 uh, 12, in this experiment. So really, uh, with the signal to noise of seven that we get, we have a single shot echo sensitivity of 2,000 spins. And uh, similar numbers were obtained uh, in a later experiment uh, by Steve Lyon in Princeton, also using a parametric amplifier. So uh, this is uh, so this is a this is a, an interesting number, but uh, the most interesting number maybe is is also uh, uh, the uh, absolute sensitivity. And for that, we need to know how 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 rapidly we can repeat this experiment, because of course. Uh, we want to average the signal. And now this, this repetition time in, uh, in uh, magnetic resonance is fixed by one uh, physical quantity that I have not discussed so far. Uh, this is the time which is needed for this spin ensemble to actually come back to its equilibrium. Uh, so uh, this is the, the and, and for that, they have to uh, deliver their energy because at the end of a spin echo sequence, they are more or less uh, anywhere on the Bloch sphere, more or less at the equator, but they have to come back to the bottom of the Bloch sphere, which means that they have to provide energy to some bath. And so uh, this is the, the spin relaxation time, it's called T1, and uh, so we, we have to measure T1 in our system. And uh, what we find is that, uh, so this is, to measure T1, this is a, 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 a usual uh, inversion recovery sequence where we apply first a pi pulse, wait and measure with a spin echo the remaining polarization. And we find that uh, this exponential decay uh, has a time constant of 0.35 seconds. So you could think, wow, this is super long. It is super long compared to uh, many systems, in particular uh, circuits. Spins have uh, much longer uh, uh, relaxation times. But in fact, this is, this is actually super short. Uh, and I will explain why in a minute. But uh, basically, this number means that we can repeat this sequence every second, more or less, uh, because the spins will be back to equilibrium. So, so really, the, the absolute sensitivity is also 2,000 spins per root space. This is also a, a, this one, one second repetition time is, is possible. And so in fact, this relatively short T1 is, is a good news, because uh, spins can have relaxation time uh, of hours or even much longer. And in fact, this is a major problem for magnetic resonance. 
certain species do not relax anymore at low temperature, and this actually provides, this, this forbids to even measure them. So in our case, the interesting story is that this short T1 is due to physics, is due to uh, the, the Purcell effect, and to the fact that spins spontaneously emit photons via the cavity. So, uh, yes, so, so, so coming back to this, this issue, so we have the, the, this, uh, this spin uh, half system where uh, we start from the, in the excited state, and essentially the, the, the decay mechanisms for, for spins are uh, exchange of energy uh, often with maybe other spins or uh, with a phonon, a nearby phonon. So this is, these are uh, uh, common uh, relaxation mechanisms in, in spin systems. And one could also think of spontaneous emission, but in free space, if you calculate the, the rate at which this happens, uh, this is 10,000 years. So this, this T1 would be 10,000 years. So of course, it's not a usual uh, and, and practical uh, relaxation mechanism, and this is usually dismissed in magnetic resonance. However, when the spin is placed in a cavity, this is of course the case in magnetic resonance, this decay uh, becomes enhanced by the presence of the cavity, uh, and there is, uh, because uh, now the, the, the cavity spectrally and spatially confines the microwave field uh, on, the, on the spin, and so uh, when the two systems are resonant, uh, the spin can emit its, a photon in the mode, which will then decay. And now this, this per cell rate, uh, gamma p, is again given by the very same parameters that we, that we saw, these cavity QED parameters. And it's essentially proportional to g squared and to the quality factor of the resonator. This is on resonance. When the two systems are not on resonance, omega s is different from omega naught, then this rate becomes smaller and smaller in a Lorentzian way. So, uh, to reach this regime where, uh, now the, the question is, is it possible to reach this regime where this rate is uh, actually the dominant relaxation mechanism? And for that, we need a small mole volume, because G uh, will be enhanced, and a high Q cavity. And this is exactly what we've been trying to do. So, so in fact, this regime of, of per cell relaxation has been reached for many, many systems, uh, essentially systems with an electrical dipole, because then the coupling is much stronger. So this has been the case first for atoms, but then also for quantum dots in semiconducting uh, micro cavities, but uh, not, not for spins until, uh, until very recently, in fact, until this work. And the interest of having this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this regime is that uh, precisely it allows to shorten T1 on demand and uh, to accelerate spin thermalization, which is a, a, a major issue in low temperature magnetic resonance. And so uh, now that we have this expression of the per cell rate on resonance, we can compare to our experimental parameters, and we find that uh, uh, with this constant coupling of 50 hertz and quality factor of 300,000, uh, we predict a per cell rate on resonance of three per second, and this is exactly what we measure. So we can say that we are really, we seem to be in this regime. So uh, I would like to spend a few minutes to explain that uh, we have further checked whether we are in this regime or not. And to check that, uh, it's interesting to see if we can control this uh, spin relaxation. Indeed, this rate is proportional to G. So if we can choose a coupling parameter, we should be able to tune also this relaxation. Then there is also the detuning, which offers another tuning method. And uh, in fact, we've been able to, uh, to, to demonstrate the two effects. And, uh, and so maybe it's, it's interesting to understand that also in, the, in this system, in fact, it is possible to change the coupling constant. Uh, and the reason why is that uh, this is a, a schematics of the, of the device, which this is the wire through which the AC current passes. And the B1 field, which is generated by this uh, resonator, is shown as this green line. And so, so it's essential, and, but the spin's uh, axis, the spin uh, orientation is fixed by the B naught field. So, if the B naught field is uh, orientation is chosen as I, I I took so far, which is parallel to the wire, then the spins will be uh, essentially perpendicular to this B one field. So, the coupling will be maximal. This is the most desirable situation for coupling. 
but we can, we can actually rotate this field in the plane, uh, as I explained. And then the, the spins will follow. And so if you imagine that now the field is actually perpendicular to the wire, the spins will be mostly parallel to B1, so there will be no coupling anymore. And so this, this coupling will uh, just uh, vary uh, very simply with the angle between uh, the, uh, the, the two axes. And so uh, we, we measured these uh, relaxation curves for various angles. And you see that we indeed see th these are the, the relaxation curves. And you see that uh, for zero degree, this is much faster than for 60 degrees. Uh, and so when we plot uh, these uh, T1 times these relaxation rates as a function of cos squared theta, we find a very good agreement with this uh, cos squared theta linear dependence. Now, we can go further by using the detuning to, to, uh, to control the spin relaxation rate. Uh, for that, we in, in, inside this uh, echo sequence where we uh, first excite the spins and then detect them, uh, we insert some uh, detuning pulse that will just take the spin frequency and move them away from the resonator for a, a given time and bring them back in resonance. So in this way, during this time, uh, we, the, the spins should relax much slower. And this is exactly what we see. Uh, this is now, uh, now the scale is uh, 1,000 seconds, so this is 2,000 seconds. This, the resonance curve is actually uh, here, it's, it's, you, you don't see it, but as soon as you detune, you have uh, relaxation times that reach 1,000 seconds. And uh, this is shown in this plot. The blue points are experimental, and the red curve is just the, the Purcell formula with a, a, a non-radiative decay rate that stops uh, the increase of T1 and on which we, we don't know the, its origin. And so essentially it means that on resonance, really, the main mechanism for relaxation is this spontaneous emission of the spins, and we can really control it by detuning them. So uh, let me just say that we've been, uh, in recent experiments, we've changed the resonator design, and we uh, made the uh, mode volume even smaller, um, by having a, now a wire which is 500 nanometers wide. Uh, and then we reach higher sensitivities. Now we have a sensitivity of 250 spins per echo. Um, and uh, where we can repeat now also much faster because the, the Purcell effect is now much stronger uh, because of the small mode volume. And in fact, we measure T1 of 20 milliseconds, which is another proof that in the previous experiment, we were also limited by the cavity because these are really the same spins. And so by repeating, now we can repeat every 20 milliseconds. So overall, the sensitivity is now 60 spins per root phrase. Um, I think I will skip this, just to say that we can also measure some, uh, magnetic, some uh, nearby nuclear spins. So we, now we, we have signal from a few hundred nuclear spins in the vicinity of these, of these electrons. This is this electron spin echo envelope modulation that, that we have observed. Um, and uh, yes, so, so this is uh, coming back to this sensitivity curve. Uh, this is uh, where we are. So, so this, this, this new generation of magnetic resonance uh, experiments uh, enhanced in a sense by circuit QED, uh, they are here. And you see that we have gained really like four to five orders of magnitude uh, in sensitivity. And uh, in the last part of the talk, which I will skip, <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to discuss how it's possible to actually go uh, beyond this quantum limit uh, by using uh, squeezed states. So, but uh, maybe I can just explain uh, the idea very quickly. Uh, so here, so far we have had this spin echo, which is emitted by the spins and which is then detected. And as I explained, this, this noise here in the detection signal really uh, is actually due to the quantum fluctuations of the field uh, here at the input of the cavity. But now, uh, very simply, if we squeeze, uh, if we use now a, a squeezer that, that sends this, uh, that changes this uh, vacuum state into a squeezed state, uh, then if we align the phase of this squeezed state in such a way that uh, the squeezed quadrature corresponds to the quadrature on which the echo is emitted, uh, then uh, there will be less noise on the interesting quadrature where the echo is emitted. There will be more noise on the other quadrature, but there is no signal, so it doesn't matter. And uh, we have demonstrated that experimentally. 
uh, although the gain in sensitivity was actually uh, very small, it was only 12%, nevertheless, uh, the error bars are, are clear and the, the effect is there. It's really just a proof of principle so far. And so, yes, yeah, so I will uh, come to my conclusion uh, uh, to, to say that uh, there is really uh, this fruitful marriage between circuit quantum electrodynamics uh, and say, quantum optics in general and magnetic resonance, uh, both for the sensitivity, the control of the relaxation, uh, and we are also exploring other ideas to uh, actually use these effects, uh, maybe uh, dynamic nuclear polarization or other, other effects. And finally, we are also exploring the interactions between squeezing and, and spin physics. Uh, and uh, yes, and I would like to again acknowledge uh, my co-workers, and in particular Audrey Bienfait and Sebastian Probst uh, and Jared Pla. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, so, no, the other quadrature is deamplified. So it, uh, it also the, has no added noise, but it's deamplified. So, in fact, uh, then it's, you know, it's, it's, the noise will be limited by the follow-up amplifier, which is the hand. So, effectively, yes, the other quadrature becomes very noisy. But it's not, the f it's not because of the amplifier. The amplifier itself does nothing bad. Why not? It's because it's really the analogous of uh, a balanced homodyne detection. Uh, as long as you measure only one quadrature uh, and you throw the information about the other quadrature, then it's fine. And the amplifier does, yes, it's, yeah. Yes, you do add, yeah, I guess you do add noise to the other quad, well, you, you deamplify the other quadrature so you lose all signal. So, uh, this is probably a more basic question about uh, spin echo. What sets, I mean, in your experiments, the echo has a finite extent in time. Yes. That, is that just set by your amplifier bandwidth right now? Or? No, no, no. Uh, sorry. I don't think it's working anymore, but uh, I will speak loud. So, no, it's, it's not fixed by the, the amplifier bandwidth. It's fixed by the, um, the control pulses. And also the cavity. So it's it's a it's a convolution of, of of several things. First, the spins had a very short coherence time. It would be fixed by the spin coherence time. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, this is not the case. The spins are very coherent. However, the, now the control pulse excites a subset of the spins in ah. space, and this is this frequency uh, space that will give rise essentially to the to the time profile. So it's really the um, uh, it's the control pulses uh, filtered by the resonator that lead to the to the echo shape. Okay, but but does that when once you solve other problems and try to push towards single spin sensitivity, is that going to be a factor, uh, or that doesn't matter at all? No, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, um, do you have a trade-off in the quality, optimal quality factor of your cavity? You would like to make it big to enhance per cell decay and to make it small probably so that you can read out your echo without integrating too much noise. Is so, that correct? And yeah, it, well, anyway? yeah, part of it, yes. I mean, it is true that um, uh, accelerating the relaxation is important and for that you need high Q. However, there are some... Uh, yes, it, every experiment is a bit different, and I'm not sure we have uh, completely set our mind about what is the, uh, the optimum, because it's a very rich problem. Uh, first of all, you can uh, also gain by applying more pulses, uh, so-called CPMG sequences, I have not spoken about that, and then the fact of being able to repeat very, very rapidly the pulses is, is actually a good thing. So. Um, going to lower queues allows you to repeat faster to have a lot of CPMG pulses and then you gain also in sensitivity. So the trade-offs, there are trade-offs, uh, it's 
rather complex uh, optimization. And uh, for the moment, we, we, okay, we have, I guess, not a completely clear picture of what is the best regime. Uh, typically, we, we use queues between 10,000 and 200,000. And yes, we, we have not yet a clear, uh, really, like, uh, choice. Yes, the, the other cavity does absolutely nothing. It's just a way of uh, coupling, connecting, uh, the, of defining the coupling rate, defining the kappa of the resonator. It's higher in frequency. Yeah. Patrice, uh, so uh, concerning the, the, the wire that uh, you showed us, the, the smaller wire, so it is still, um, uh, in a way, I, it's, it's a rather... Um, it's not the thinnest wire that you could uh, use. It, uh, it, you could also use a multi-wire configuration. Have you thought about some other nanostructures to couple to, to the spins? Yes, so you're absolutely right. I mean, this is like you know, 500 nanometers. We can definitely make quite a bit narrower. Uh, and we've, so we've attempted that, and uh, we've seen nothing. So then we decided to go to... Uh, a wider wire. So th the problem is that, so uh, we we went to uh, we did experiments with very narrow wires uh, between 20 nanometers and 100 nanometers, and the resonators are fine. But so far we've had no signal with them, probably because uh, so the lines actually are very much broadened by this strain, as you as you may have seen. And in fact, when we go to narrow wires, we, we see that this, this, this distribution actually increases. And then it becomes actually difficult to know even where to look for. So I think this is maybe the reason why we've seen nothing in these uh, uh, narrow wires on bismuth in silicon. But we're gonna revisit this, uh, this, uh, this problem in the, in the coming months. We have ideas to, to solve that. But uh, yes, we, we've not seen uh, donors so we, we, we were aiming for this like really few donors coupling and we have not seen any signal. So this is why we, we kind of took a step back and uh, went for a slightly uh, wider uh, wire. Essentially the mode volume uh, really becomes smaller and so if you, then if you have a few spins, the, the problem is, in fact the biggest problem is to know where they are and to find them. In the, at the beginning you scan your the B not field, and you want to find the resonance. We see nothing, then <laughs> it's not easy. So I think as soon as we see something in this regime, uh, experiments will be quite easy. But uh, so far, with these very narrow wires, we have very small mode vo detection volume. And then if we have no spins, or, or that the spins are not at the frequency or the magnetic field at which we look for them, then we see. So this is why we are going step by step. <laughs> Could you say something about how fast you can actually rabi flop your spin? Because that's probably set by also the queue and the microwave power you can deliver and so on. Yes, but it's really not, it's not a, I would say it's not a problem really because, uh, so we were a bit worried about that, but uh, the experiments, the, the, the data that I showed, I think we, so okay, I don't have the exact numbers, but we can definitely do uh, rotations in megahertz with quite moderate powers. So nanowatts, or it's, uh, it's quite OK, because, uh, because uh, you know, G is large, uh, the Q is high, so this, is, this compensates for, uh, I mean, usual magnetic resonance uses kilowatt amplifiers. So of course, there was this uh, worry of the power. But you know, of course, we gain by making the, the mode volume very small and the quality factor very big. So this is, why this, this is also why this inductive detection Having the spins on resonance with the cavity is uh, is nice from that point of view also. Uh, sure. that, uh, it also allows you to drive them. <laughs> <laughs>